Hi everybody, this is 10 Tech Tools for Reaching and Teaching ELLs. My name is Laura Jerka and I'm an elementary ESOL instructional coach in Maryland. I'm also a certified Google Education Trainer, a certified Google Innovator, and a certified Google Educator Level 1 and 2. In order to get the handout for today's presentation, please go to the bit link that you see here. It's bit.ly backslash ELL Tech 10. Please be aware that this link is case sensitive, so you'll need to type it exactly as you see it here. Very quickly, I just want to show you how to use um, the HyperDocs notes. If you go to the bit link that I have for you, keep in mind it is case sensitive. Um, then you will be asked to make a copy of the document. All you're going to do is click make a copy. And it will open the HyperDoc with references and examples of each of the tech tools that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, this is your copy, so there's also a place here for notes if you want to take notes during the presentation. As an ESOL instructional coach, I believe that technology has many benefits for our English language learners. Uh, not only to support academic and content knowledge, but to also support language growth. So it also offers students the ability to access information in a, in a variety of multiple modes, such as audio, video, text, images, and more. It gives our students the ability to demonstrate understanding in a variety of ways that are appropriate to their English language proficiency level. It makes it easy for educators like ourselves to scaffold and differentiate for students at a variety of English proficiency levels. And students get to participate in authentic tasks that support the 21st century skills that they will need when they move out into the college and career world and beyond. So let's dive into the tools that I'm going to share with you today. The first one is digital bulletin boards. Many of you are already familiar with these tools. Um, I'm sure everybody here has heard of Padlet before. There are some great things about Padlet. For one, uh, you can get a basic account for free, uh, and that gives you three Padlets to create. If you want to create any more than that, then you either have to delete some of your created Padlets, or you need to sign up for a paid account. Another pro to Padlet is that students do not need accounts to post or comment. There are various sticky types that they can add to the Padlet, such as text, video, link, and images. And Padlet is easily customizable in terms of background and what, what you want your Padlet to look like, who can access it, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, again, the big con on this is that since they've moved to a more paid model, then you have to pay if you want to create more than three additional Padlets. So here's an example of what a KWL chart that I created in Padlet for my students about fossils looks like. So another alternative is Linuit.com. It is free. Students do not need accounts to post or to comment. There are various sticky types that you can add, such as text, video, link, and image. Um, but one of the big cons is that it's not very customizable in terms of background and sticky layout. Uh, and the stickies can overlap, making it difficult to read all of them. So here's an example of a Linuit. Uh, board that I use. I use this for PD uh, and you can see it, it's a little uh, there's plenty of room for everybody to post but it's a little over overcrowded uh, visually so that could be a bit of a deterrent to using this if you have a lot of students in a class. Some of the things that you can use this for with your English language learners uh, and there are examples and links in your hyperdoc. Some of the uses for English language learners is as a digital word wall with text and images. You can use it to create graphic organizers like the KWL chart that I showed you. Um, the Linuit that I showed you is an example of an exit slip or a learning reflection for professional development. Works the same with students. And also for question boards. If students have questions and they don't feel comfortable raising their hand, they could post it on a Padlet or a Linuit or another digital bulletin board. Tech tip number two that I would like to share with you today is New Zealand. This is a great resource for getting current events, articles about science, math, arts, culture, politics, anything under the sun that you might want to have your students read about. Uh, some of the big pros are that it is free for basic features. 
You can get articles at multiple lexile levels. You can get articles in English and Spanish. You can choose from a variety of topics and content areas. And a lot of it is based on current events that are going on right now. Um, so far, the cons are that I haven't found any, really, um, except for you can't access the premium features unless you want to pay a fee. Uh, but I've been using it for years just fine without the premium features. When you're using this with ELLs, it's great for differentiating their text based on their reading level or their English language proficiency level. You can find articles that will engage your students based on their own particular interests. Um, you can make cross-cultural connections for your English language learners uh, and cross-curricular connections as well. Reading articles that they see themselves in or that are related to them can also help promote self-to-world connections. And you can use these articles to build background about different topics of study that you're going to be tackling in your class. So let's take a quick look at NewZealand.com. You do need to register for an account. Uh, and once you have an account, you can sign in. I really like this because I can sign in with um, my Google account that I have through school. Um, once you're signed in, you can go to the library and search for a variety of resources. You can also see they have articles available in Spanish, uh, and they're constantly adding new things every single day. You can choose based on the reading skill, the text level, um, whether you're lower elementary, upper elementary, middle, high school, you can choose um, things that have different features. There's just so much you can really do with uh, NewZealand.com, and it's a great tool for differentiating for your students. All of the articles contain the same basic information, but they offer them at a variety of text levels. And you can see you can choose right through here the text levels that you want. And this one goes all the way down to second grade and all the way up to fifth grade. So. As far as differentiation goes, Newzilla is an amazing tool and you can use it totally free. They do have pro features that allow you to create classes and push out assignments and articles to the classes. And there's a couple of different other features uh, with the premium account as well. So, However, like I said, the free account, you can get tons of appropriate level texts for your students that all contain the same information. They all look basically the same. The kids won't really know that they're getting different articles based on their reading level. And again, you can choose from a variety of, of genres and topics, and you can also search if you're looking for something specific. And that's New Zealand in a nutshell. The third tech tool I would like to share with you today is a tool called picto for me This tool allows you to create uh, communication boards for your English language learners. Typically, communication boards are used with students who are on the spectrum or have other special education issues, but they can be very, very effective to use with students who have limited proficiency, and there are a few other uses for English language learners as well. picto for me is available either at their website or as a Google extension for Chrome. You can um, also access it from Google Drive. So some of the pros are that it's free. It is integrated with Google Drive. You can use their library of images that are already available, or you can upload your own. You can create communication boards that are printable or digital, and the user interface is very easy to use. So far, I haven't really found any cons when using this tool. Some of the things that you can do with it for ELLs are to create personalized word walls or communication boards for your newcomers who have very limited language. You can also use them to create vocabulary cards for language practice and vocabulary games. Very quickly, I just want to take a moment to show you how easy it is to use picto for me Once you have it installed in your Chrome browser, you'll see the icon appear over here. You'll just click and choose Editor. First thing we want to do is give our project a name. Um, from here you can also change out the numbers of columns and rows as desired. If you want to have 4x4 four four or 3x3, three three, um, that's easy enough to do from right here. Now all I need to do to add words and images is to just click here. And since we're doing weather vocabulary, we'll start out with maybe tornado.
and you can see once it's in there, um, then I have some options. I can size it down just a little bit, and there's my first square. so it doesn't overlap our word. And so you can see it's really easy to create uh, a personalized word wall or a communication board for your English language learners. Another way to use this is to have students create their own um, personalized word wall where they can include words that they know they need to learn. So, and that's it. That's how you use Picto for me. The fourth tool I'm excited to share with you today is called Blabberize. This is a fun website that is great for speaking practice where students upload their image. Um, it doesn't have to be an image of them. It can be an image of an animal or a book character or anything else. And um, then they record themselves. It's great for speaking practice. There are no time limits on recording. The videos that they create are easy to share, embed, or download. Um, students can choose pictures instead of videoing themselves as with other tools. And they find it really, really fun and engaging because they get to make the picture talk. Some of the cons are that it does take practice to get the hang of placing the talking mouths on the photo correctly. And students do need an account if they want to save work for later. However, you could get around this by using a single class account if you wanted to. Blabberize can be found at www.blabberize.com. And for ELLs, it's great for speaking practice. It's great to use as an exit slip for book reviews or for oral presentations and summaries. If you check the hyperdoc, you'll find some examples of these types of uses that you can view. So very quickly, let's take a look at how to use Blabberize. This is the home page for blabberize.com. You're just going to come down here and you're going to click Make. Now, this, um, you do have to use it on a device that has Adobe Flash. First thing you're going to do is find a picture that you would like to use. Um, let's take a look at the orangutan that I used earlier. It will allow you to select the area of the picture that you want in case you don't want to use the whole picture. And then you're just going to scroll down and click the next button. And here's the part where you add the mouth. Now, you can see it has lots of little dots around it to help you shape the mouth. So let me just shape this mouth a little bit. By dragging the dots in. And you can make your mouth as neat or as sloppy or as big or as small as you would like. And then this dot controls which direction it goes and how far down it can go when you're recording. Once you've got your mouth in place and you're happy with it, you can click Next. You can choose to upload something that you've already recorded or you can record from your device's microphone. That's what I'm going to do in this case. I have to allow. And now you can see when I talk, it will move the mouth. And if you're not quite happy with it, you can go back and make adjustments. Hello, I'm an orangutan. You can see that changing the location of that bottom dot also allowed me to change uh, the direction that the mouth moved. Mostly I like mine to just move up and down. When you're ready, you'll click the record button. Hello, I'm an orangutan. This is an example. Click the record button again to stop, and then click Next. You can play it to see if you're happy with it. Hello, I'm an orangutan. This is an example. And then you click OK. You can add another scene, or you can just um, edit the scene that you made, or you can just save it if you only want that one scene. And I'm going to log in.
and I'm going to give it a title and a description. You must fill in all of these fields. And I simply put education in the tags and then click save. And once you've saved it, you can share it um, via link or by embedding it using the code. You can get it on video and download it. You can edit it or you can delete it from your examples. And that's it for Blabberize. It's a pretty easy tool to use. So let's go ahead and move on to tool number five. This is a really cool tool called Insert Learning, which allows you to create interactive lessons from any website, article, PDF, document. You can find it at insertlearning.com. It's also available as a Chrome extension. And some of the pros for this are that it's integrated with Google. Students do not need to have another login to use it. It's very easy to use as both a teacher and a student. It's easy to share created lessons with students and with other teachers. And uh, they do have a free version that allows you to have five lessons at a time. And the paid version is actually very affordable. Um, but the con is that the individual teacher license, though affordable, um, it does allow you unlimited lessons and unlimited students, but it is $40 per year. This is really, really great tool for ELLs because you can create differentiated, interactive, multimodal lessons. You can insert videos, you can insert, um, for example, flashcards from Quizlet, you can embed things from other websites, you can add videos of yourself, you can add questions, you can add discussions, you can annotate texts. Um, and it allows you to really easily include scaffolds and language supports directly into the text that you want students to work with. Um, this works great with Newzilla, for example. Let's take a look at how the Chrome version of Insert Learning works. I have got this article that I would like to build an interactive lesson with. And so now that I've got the extension uh, installed on my Chrome browser, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to click the icon. And as you can see, it will open the toolbar for me here so that I can begin working on making this an interactive lesson. Now, the first thing I want to do at the beginning is put a set of uh, Quizlet flashcards that I have created. So I'm going to go over to Quizlet and I'm going to uh, get my embed code. And I want to embed the flashcards. So I'm going to copy that HTML and I'm going to paste it right here and that brings up and embeds the Quizlet cards right here in this lesson for me so that the students don't have to go back and forth. Now I can go through and add other interesting things for example if I wanted to add a video. I'm going to add it here after this. Here's the video that I want. I'm going to paste it here and again, the video appears embedded directly in the lesson. I can also do some other things. Uh, for example, I can highlight some text if I want to. So um, let's say this is important. It inhabited during the Cretaceous period. I can also add notes to that if I want to add a comment. Um, So if the students, you know, that you, you can highlight it for them, the students can highlight it themselves. Um, you can add comments to the information that you highlighted. And it'll show up uh, not only highlighted, but outlined. You can also insert questions if you would like. Um, so let's insert a question just so you can see how that goes.
and I can assign a point value to those questions if I want so that when students answer it. Um, down at the end, I might, um, down here at the end, I might want to add a discussion. So let's go ahead and do that. So, and that's just an example of some of the things that you can do with this particular tool to create interactive lessons for your students. Of course, you can also embed things like Padlet or Linuit. Um, you can still use uh, other great tools along with this. These are just a couple of examples. And it really does create an interactive lesson that does not require your students to flip back and forth between numerous tabs or numerous screens. Tool number six is one that you may have some familiarity with if you're familiar with G Suite for Education, and that's Google Drawings. I think this one is widely underused, and it can be especially useful for English language learners. Um, so you can access it by going to drawings.google.com if you have a Google account. And on the pro side, it is part of G Suite. I think it's really easy to use, especially if you're already familiar with um, Google Suite for Education. It can be used on its own or as part of a Google Doc, and it's versatile for creating a variety of activities, which we'll talk about, and you can find some examples of, of different types of activities that I've used it for on your HyperDoc. On the con side, students will need to practice with drag and drop if you're doing drag and drop activities so that they don't accidentally resize tiles or images that they're supposed to be dragging and dropping. And that's really the only con I've found with this. Um, for ELLs, it's great for interactive activities, for creating graphic organizers, for having students sort and classify things using drag and drop, for creating comic strips, uh, it's great for mind maps, and also interactive timelines where they can drag and drop things into the correct places on the timelines. So I just want to take a few minutes and give you a quick demo of Google Drawings for those of you who aren't as familiar with it. Um, and within Google Drawings, it's very easy to create a graphic organizer or a drag and drop activity in almost no time. So let's say we are reading an article about school uniforms and I want students to weigh the pros and cons. First let's change our background to white or whatever color you might want to use. I'm going to add a text box to give a title and some instructions. Now that I've got some instructions in, I'm going to go ahead and start actually creating my organizer. I'm going to use the shape tool and create a shape that students can fill information into. These shapes can also be used for tiles that students can drag and drop. And I want them to be fairly uniform, so I'm just going to copy and paste. And they're too big, so let's adjust their size a little bit. And Let's give, let's, let's make one of these text boxes into a header. Make sure it's lined up. And the header for this one. Let's change the color of one of these to give a little bit more variety. And now I want to spice this up. Let's add a thumbs up and a thumbs down picture just to help add some more scaffolding to this. Like this one. So let's insert that. And adjust to size. And add in thumbs down. that one. Adjust to size. And there we go. A really quick graphic organizer. Moving on to tool number seven is Flipgrid. 
This is a tool that I'm sure you're all familiar with by now. However, I would be absolutely remiss if I left this out of a presentation on tools for English language learners. Flipgrid is a tool that allows students to upload videos of themselves. It can be found at www.flipgrid.com. This is a great tool to help your students practice speaking and academic language. On the pro side, it's totally free. Students do not need their own login. Grids are now protected by passcode. Students can get practice recording themselves on a computer, which will be important, especially if you're in a WIDA state, because students must do this on the Access for ELLs test for the speaking portion. It's very easy to use for both teachers and students, and in my experience, students find it very engaging. On the con side, now that it's totally free to teachers, I really haven't found any cons. Some of the great uses for ELLs is, you know, just practicing oral language use. Have them do an exit slip or summary of learning. Um, give them a bank of teacher-created tutorials for the current unit. Uh, you can practice global collaboration with classrooms and teachers around the world. And you could use it for students to give book reviews for other students to watch and help them decide what to read. There's really so many different ways that you can use this. For those of you not familiar with Flipgrid, I want to go ahead and give you a quick overview. So this is what the Flipgrid site looks like. If you haven't gotten an account already, you're going to click Sign Up Today. If you already do have an account, you're going to click Educator Login. And this will take, me to your, or take you to your dashboard. Your dashboard shows all of the grids that you have. Now that Microsoft uh, has joined up with Flipgrid and everything is free, you can create as many grids as you want. So you could have a grid for each classroom or group of students that you work with, or you can have one grid for everything, which is what I have chosen to do. So I'm going to go into my grid where I can see the list of my topics, and I can make some changes, I can make them active or inactive, I can share them, I can also edit them. From here, I can also add a new topic. So let's go through some of the features in um, creating a topic. So first thing you're going to do is provide a title. So going back to that example that we used previously when I was talking about Google Drawings, you can decide how long you want the student response to be, all the way up to five minutes, which is pretty cool. You can choose when you want the topic to appear and be, and be visible and open for students. Here you can add your uh, question or the topic that you want students to discuss. Now going on down, I can choose um, some privacy settings. One thing that a lot of teachers like to do is moderate the responses. So the responses have to be approved by you before they appear on the grid, which can um, help avoid problems of mischievous students making inappropriate videos. Down to topic status, you can make your topic active, um, frozen, or inactive. When it's frozen, students can view responses but can't add to it. And when it's inactive, it, it disappears completely. Nobody's able to access it. Um, so you can choose your launch and your freeze date here in this window, and that sort of automates the process for you. Here's where you can add resources to your topic. Anything that you want your students to have access to while they are completing um, the task. So that you can record a video of yourself talking about the topic or asking the question. You can upload a video from YouTube or Vimeo. Um, you can upload a video from your drive, you can add images, you can add a GIF, and you can add emojis. Down here, you can also link to items like Google Docs or websites that might help students complete the task. And um, then down here are the response features. What can students do when they're responding? Students can add stickers and drawings to their videos. I usually turn this off because a lot of students end up spending more time on that than they do on creating their response, and it ends up wasting time. Um, but occasionally it can be fun to allow them to do it. Down here you can allow students to um, respond to one another's, uh, or, or to react to one another's uh, videos with emojis, with likes only, or you can just turn that feature off altogether. With this toggle, you can turn off the, um, the display that shows students how many times a particular video has been viewed. 
Up here, this toggle allows you to turn on and off the ability for students to respond to one another. You can also allow, just like you can add resources to your uh, topic, students, if you have this turned on, students can add um, links to a website or a video or something germane to their response uh, to their video as well. And then down here, you can allow students to um, create a title for their response. And that's the basic features of Flipgrid. I think this is a great tool for helping English language learners practice speaking, and especially since um, many states are WIDA states now and the access for ELL's uh, yearly English language proficiency test does require students to record themselves. Tool number eight is called Rewordify. It's an easy to use website that allows you to simplify difficult text. Rewordify can be found at www.rewordify.com. On the pro side, it's absolutely free. It can simplify websites or plain text, and it's an easy way to simplify text for differentiation to serve students at multiple proficiency levels. On the con side, I definitely recommend reviewing the text or the website that you've simplified before sharing with students. The service is pretty good and usually accurate, but sometimes it simplifies things in a way that doesn't quite make sense. So definitely review before sharing with students. Also on the con side, it doesn't work with documents like PDF or Google Docs. So if you have documents like that that you want to simplify, you will need to copy and paste plain text into the Rewordify editor. This is a great tool for newcomers and lower proficiency students especially. It simplifies difficult text, it makes modification and differentiation easy for you, the educator, and it makes your content more accessible for English language learners. Let's take a quick look at Rewordify.com. This is a great website to help you simplify text for your English language learners and helps with differentiation as well. So here you can enter plain text or you can enter the URL of a website that you would like to simplify. So I have this website from National Geographic about the desert, and let's just paste that URL in there. Now, I can rewordify the web page and display it, or I can ask rewordify to pull down the text only. I find that this is a little bit messy with websites because of all of the extra metadata that's in there. So I prefer to have them just rewordify the web page and display it. Now, when viewing, the rewordified web page, you can see highlighted all of the words that they have changed. And if you hover over it or click on it, you can see the original word that they replaced. This makes the text a little bit more readable for students who might have difficulty otherwise because of low English proficiency or reading struggles or things like that. I will say that this is not perfect, so you may want to check over it yourself before you pass it on to students like this. Um, but this is a very valuable tool, and it, even if it's not perfect uh, every single time it rewordifies something, it's a great starting place and can save you a lot of work. Tool number nine is one of my favorite tools on this list. It's a tool called Read and Write from Text Help. It's available as standalone software or as a Chrome extension. You can follow the bit link up above. Keep in mind it is case sensitive. On the pro side for Read and Write, you can get a free account for teachers. It's available as installable software or a Chrome extension, as I mentioned. It's very easy to use, and it integrates with Google and Microsoft. On the con side, to get a license for students, it's $12 per license for 250 or more students. Um, if you can use the free version available to teachers, that's great. Some of the great uses for ELLs, this is particularly excellent for our newcomers and lower proficiency students. It reads aloud documents and websites. It utilizes speech to text. It allows annotation features such as highlighting and notes. There is a translation feature there for language one support. And it includes a dictionary and picture dictionary to help scaffold for students as well. This is another tool that works really great with articles from New Zila, things like PDFs, Google Docs, uh, websites, you name it. Tool number 10, we've finally reached our last stop on our journey through the world of ELL Ed Tech. This tool is a website called World Stories. This website is a library of stories from all around the world. Side, it's free. There are hundreds of stories in English and around 29 other languages. Stories come from a variety of cultures, and most of the stories have audio and text available. 
It does allow you, if you use their register website, to create classes and assign books. Um, while they do have a lot of things on the free account or the free website um, that you don't have to register for, on the con side, if you do want access to audio and PDF, you must register for their register website, which is still free. Their register website also has a variety of premium features that you can get for an extra cost. And this one is the biggest con to me. You must create a login or password for the students, but that is totally up to you and in your control as to how you set that up. When you're using this with ELLs, I think it's a great way to promote cultural awareness and appreciation among students and to celebrate the very diversity of students in your own classroom. Uh, the stories include myths, fables, and other types of fictional literature. It's great for practicing receptive language skills, such as listening and reading, and it's a great way to help students connect to their own culture and the cultures of their classmates. So let's take a look at the World Stories site. They do have a free site that is open to the public, but they also have a slightly nicer site that you can register for for free, and after you register, they will send you credentials that you can log into. Um, but on their open site, you can see they have several options for languages that you can choose from, and they have stories available both in English and the language that you choose. Now, it's important to note that sometimes the story isn't available in the second language unless you have already registered, and then you can find it on their other site. Uh, you also can't get the audio features unless you register for their free site as well. So there is some stuff available out here for free, but a lot of it they have moved over to their registration site. Now, once you register, you get your credentials and you log in, you will see a page that looks like this, and this is the library. You can choose books to push out to your students based on genre, uh, the kinds of features that you're looking for, such as audio or comic book layout, you can you choose based on languages, and you can choose based on their levels that they have, which are heavily based on age and interests. Um, you do need to create groups and create students and provide them with a login, which can be done on the Peoples and Groups tab. And so let's take a look at a book and see what that looks like. Uh, all of the stories are available in English and one other language based on the culture that the story comes from. So I'm going to uncheck English so we can narrow it down to another language like Spanish, since I have quite a few Spanish-speaking students. And then it gives me a list of books that are available in English and in Spanish. There's not many here right now, but I do understand that they are adding more continuously. So let's say I want to narrow this down a little bit more, and I want one that also has audio features. So I can click there, and here are the three books that I have to choose from. So let's click on this one, and we can preview the book. And here's what the book looks like. I can turn on the audio. El león herido. Érase una vez una pastorcilla muy pobre cuyo trabajo era llevar la manada de vacas desde la aldea hasta el prado donde pastaban en la tarde. And so students can have the book read aloud to them or they can read on their own as well. If you want to pay for their premium features, you can get things like shared highlighting to push out to students, but still it's pretty nice for free. This is a great way to infuse cultural literature into your classroom and give students a chance to share stories from their culture with one another, to read about other cultures, and it's a great way to include um, technology in the reading portion and to provide differentiated and adapted texts for students since you can push out different books to different students. And that's World Stories. Thank you for joining me today to learn more about how to use technology to support the language and academic growth of your English language learners.